Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Capital One Bank, New York Community Bank, Eastern Consolidated, m and Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Dime Community Bank. Additional funding has been provided by Amtrust Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citizens Bank, Colliers International, NYC, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Real Estate Organization, Handro Properties, Hodges Ward Elliott, Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Marinkoff Family Foundation, the Moynian Organization, Moynian Capital Partners, and these friends. Condomaniac! That's what people are saying. Is the world falling apart? How's the world with condos? I don't think it's really bad. I think I've gone to my crystal apple and I've rubbed it around and it's basically said, it seems to be relatively shiny. But as opposed to me making the opinion, I've assembled this group of condo developers and real estate developers and the banker, the man who's lending some money to tell us the truth of the condo world in New York City. My guests, they include the founder and the president of Alchemy Properties, Ken Horn, the chairman and the CEO of DDG, Joe McMillan, and their banker, George DeRay, who is the vice president at M&T Bank Commercial Real Estate. So I'm going to ask the banker first. Is the condo market alive, dead, or shiny? No, it's very, it's very much alive. Uh, there was a lot of product that came online, and there were varying theories about the right size and mix of units, but all the condo loans we're in, we're very happy with the pre-sales we're seeing. Some of our projects are more than covering our loan at this point. And I think there's a functioning market, certainly below 3 million and definitely even up to 5 million. Obviously there's a ultra luxury space that's attracted some, you know, questions, but in the, you know, several million dollar space, there is a vibrant and functional market. You've been in the condo business for I think you started in 1990 in your business. That's correct. So you've been doing condos all over, over those years. And you have a couple of developments there, including the famous Woolworth building. And then you have a property on the Upper West Side. All right, so we've done 33 buildings now in New York City. And we've ridden through every conceivable cycle. Uh, and I think that the world today, as George pointed out, is, is good as long as your product is good. And as long as you price it correctly, and as long as you renovate correctly, and as long as you deliver the correct product to the correct market. Uh, and so we're doing three projects, you pointed out. We're doing the Woolworth building, which really does fit into that ultra luxury category. We're doing another building on 30th and 6th, which is really in the, the lower end of the high end, so to speak. And we're doing a building. What do you mean by the lower end? Well, of the in, high the, end. in the sense that, that you're in the low $2,000 a foot, right? Woolworth is obviously considerably higher. And the uh, building we're doing on 81st Street 
uh, between Broadway and West End is, you know, more in line with the Woolworth pricing. So we believe, and what we've seen, is every market is different. You have to build your buildings differently. And you can't strive to get certain pricing in various neighborhoods where it's impossible to hit those numbers. You know, going back, I, I remember a couple of times that you had been on the show, and I, uh, there's a great comment that you once made. We were talking about, at one time, you could build, sell off spec without plans, and then there was another time you said you had to, you had to finish the model and show them the apartment. And then there was the question about the ovens, the high price ovens. And you said to me that people, they never used their oven. They were keeping their shirts in there, right? One particular buyer actually did that in a project we did in Soho. He actually, when we met him several years later, he opened up his, his oven and, and he actually had his shirts in a box in the oven. So my <laughs> question is today, do you have to sh show a completed project or are people taking it from the plants? I think it depends. It depends. So, for instance, our property on the Upper West Side, we sold 20% you know, of the units within 10 days off my conference room table. We had conference room table, as correct. opposed. We didn't have a sales did office. Did you use open. artificial intelligence? No. Okay. Did you know, you we, use we had renderings. We had floor plans. We had a list of finishes. Um, our, our sales office now has been open since January. Uh, you, the building's topped out. It's being built, but there's nothing representative of what a unit's going to look like inside the building, and we are now on our fifth price increase in 90 days. That market is such that there was a scarcity of product. We happened to hit it at the right time, and we developed the units commensurate with what the market was looking for. Um, similarly, down at uh, 30th Street, uh, a handful of people bought off of floor plans, but we had an off-site sales office, which was more instrumental in terms of selling because they were first-time buyers. And just now, because we have the TCO, we can get people into the building. We just finished two models. So I think it varies product by product. And uh, Joe, I, 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 you, I'm not sure you have the same experience, but it, it certainly there's nothing consistent in terms of saying you have to do it one way, product but by product. In many ways, and I, <clears throat> I don't want to speak for Joe, your, your products are more than the $2,000 price per foot. Okay, so we're dealing with more of a luxury market or a boutique market and certain type of things. Let's talk about some of the projects you have today. Yeah, we've done uh, 15 projects, you know, probably you know, slightly less than half the number you've done. And I've been around since 2009. We've had a similar experience to Ken where there are certain circumstances where we've sold very successful, off plan, out of a sales gallery, without an on-site model. And we've had other projects where we found it more effective to sell when the building's almost finished. You know, wait till the building's almost done, you're several months from delivering, and then sell. I don't think there's a one size fits all. And I think it really depends on location, scarcity value. For instance, we have what I would argue is the, the best project in Brooklyn right now, in Brooklyn Heights. It's the highest priced ever, $16.5 million for a penthouse apartment, highest price in the borough. I'm sure it'll be surpassed at some point, but it's a scarcity value. There's no product there. We have one unit left in that building to sell. Right, but in a similar manner to what Ken was saying, on the Upper West Side, there's a scarcity of product for that type of product, okay? Correct. There's a need. There's a need in downtown Brooklyn, and not in Brooklyn Heights, because it's not really downtown Brooklyn. It's a different neighborhood. I think it's neighborhood-centric on the type of things. 100%. And we, we have five buildings we're actively selling in now with prices that range from you know, around $1.5 million to, to just shy of $30 million. And we've signed contracts in the last several months in all of them. And it, it really depends on what you're offering, you know, what's the situation in the building, what is the buyer situation. But the, the, the kind of market right now, I'd say, is very stable in New York City. Uh, we're also seeing it's stable in Palm Beach where we're building. Uh, we, don't, we don't have concerns. It, it, you hear you press here, press there about the, the market having issues. We're not seeing it in our portfolio, and we're selling across the portfolio. To that, I think it's product by product. So we believe, frankly, that 81st Street, we think it's going to be sold out probably nine months before we complete. You know, frankly, we're almost there. And no, uh, yet, yet I believe also that certain types of product where um, you have first-time buyers, there are many buyers who are first-time buyers who are more apprehensive to buy until they walk into the product and they can feel the product, look at the views, see the amenities, see the finishes, see where the lobby is. Um, the buyer pool uh, down at Woolworth is an entirely different buyer pool 
because we've got people who are combining units who are trying to customize units. So even in the scale of three buildings that we're doing, the marketing is entirely different, the buyer pool is different, and the finishes are different. When you talk about the buyer pool, and I'm going to get back to George in a second as the lender, when we're talking about the buyer pool, are we talking about where are these buyers from? Okay, because people say, are they native New Yorkers? Are they pe relocating from different parts? Because I, I do remember, I think maybe it was shows that Joe was on, people who were on the Upper East Side wanted to relocate down to the Meatpacking District or into Tribeca. Uh, where, where, where are the buyers? Are they, are they South American people coming in? We're, we're seeing a lot of local buyers. You know, there are foreign buyers in all of our projects. We've sold a, a percentage of foreign buyers across. It depends on the neighborhood, depends on the project. At 180 East 88th Street, we're building the tallest building on the Upper East Side. We've had a number of local buyers. You know, given the, the demographics of the area, some of the best schools in the city, it's absolutely fantastic. A lot of buyers are buying for that reason. Uh, they're buying for the views, they're buying for the amenities, we're doing a basketball court. We have other projects downtown in Soho where we've seen maybe more out-of-town buyers. You have more European buyers or someone who's buying a pied-à-terre, so I really think it depends. Question. Yep. How are you making determination of who to lend to? Okay, I know you've been lending to Joe since 2009 and Ken many, many years in different things. But how are you making that determination because, you know, this is speculative. You know, it's, it's like a restaurant opening up, okay? You don't know how it's going to do. And so tell me about that. Sure. I mean, it's the same uh, process that it's always been. It's uh, an insight. We try to look at the overall sponsor capabilities, who their capital partners are, the sophistication of the capital partner. You know, you never want to be in a tough situation with dumb money who doesn't understand that, you know, construction is a, is a difficult business, the regulations and I can relate coming from financial services, the regulations are getting tighter and you know evolving at all, all uh, times. Relationship matters, uh, track record matters, character matters, uh, the composition of the team matters. How do matter. you make a bet? Okay, here, here's my question. 1990, Ken Horton starts in business. 2009, Joe McMillan starts in business. How do you make a bet on the new kid on the block? How do you make the judgment at that time. I hate to say, Ken's was a much easier situation because he's had the track record for many years. And I do remember Joe McMillan in 2009. I think I remember Joe McMillan even before 2009. We go back to probably 2007. How do you make that decision to bet on him? It's a getting to know you process. I mean, we spent how many visits to sites, how many visits to your office, talking to the team, talking about the development process and it's in some ways I mean our you know very well-known and well-regarded chairman Bob Wilmer's passed last fall but it's it's old-fashioned banking and it feels like a cliche to say but we went out we walked the projects we walked the office we talked to Joe we talked to his partners we talked to his team I remember I think we had some meeting they were explaining how they could track down to like every you know nut and bolt in the project and that's important um, you know, we had some character references, you know, everything. It's how, how does anybody bootstrap their way into any business? But here's the situation. A lot of people, and we've seen this, Joe has seen this, Ken has seen this. We, we have a lot of people who may have worked three years, four years with some developer. And then they decide that they want to go on their own. They're undercapitalized. You know, they don't get the traditional bank. They may have gotten, as I had the week before, the alternative lenders over mm -hmm. there. It's not an easy thing to go into development, Okay. But that, that's why I believe that it's a good time to be developing condominiums now. Joe and I were actually talking about this, that the equity markets have tightened up and the lender markets have tightened up because of a lot of the innuendo and a lot of the scuttlebutt about how the majority of the condo world is not good. And it's not, it's not true. But being able to develop counter-cyclically with experienced developers is something that a bank like M&T helps us with because they have the experience with us and the breadth of knowledge knowing that it takes three years to build a building. Right, and Joe was saying in the green room, what were you saying about the best times that you've had on sales? The, be the, the, the best time is uh, when nobody else is buying. I mean, candidly, when everyone else is running out of the room is when you want to be running into the room. When yeah. everyone else is selling assets is when you want to be buying assets. And back to your, your question a minute ago or a comment to George, just, you know, we've done you know, many loans with M&T now. If you total it up between construction, 
you know, acquisition and end loans, we're at 10 or 12 loans with, mm. with, with a bank, and it all started to close the first loan you know, many years ago. And I give George and the team a lot of credit you know, they, they bet on a team. If I look at the team we have at DDG, and they did meet, uh, you know, they met me, they met uh, everyone else, they, they, they toured the sites, they met our partners, they really got to know us as individuals, mm -hmm. and they made sure that everyone throughout the bank, all the way up to the late chairman, knew something about us or knew us personally, and that was critical. And it was a very lengthy process. Uh, at, candidly, at the time we did our first loan, I was questioning whether the process would ever end. It was that rigorous <laughs> of a process, but it did and the first deal, but got the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and on and on. And, and now it's been a very healthy relationship for both of us. Over the last 10 years that you've been developing, the last 28 years, okay, at one time it was the New York Times, okay? Today, I haven't seen a DDG ad or an Alchemy ad in the New York Times, but I've seen ads from, I think, maybe yours or from competitors in certain magazines such as Avenue and certain social media type of thing. How has social media branding marketing changed and helped your properties? Well, in our, we, at this particular point, we have very little print advertising, very little. Um, to take a full page ad out in the New York Times is almost a vanity purchase now. I mean, maybe to announce the product, but as a continual basis, you know, the answer is it's not done. I mean, we just moved our offices about two weeks ago and I had a little pouch of cutout of New York Times classified ads that we did for buildings 20 years ago, 25 years ago, where someone would wake up Sunday morning, they get the Times, they'd open it up, they'd circle the project they wanted to see, they'd make a call and they'd go and look at it on a Sunday open house. Now, it's not done that way. They're all very different metrics in terms of, we have people just work for us who just track the metrics in terms of what websites people are looking at and how you attract buyers, what kind of so income are, levels you're are after. Are you utilizing Instagram? Are you using Facebook? 100%. We, we, we have a, a full-time firm on retainer that does search engine optimization. Mm -hmm. They track all of our ad spend as it relates to digital. Uh, we utilize dedicated uh, you know, Instagram. We have dedicated Facebook. It, the migration has been significant over the last several years. We've continued to do the occasional New York Times ad, as you referenced, but the majority of our ad spend is in digital media. But even outside of ad spend, what we try to do is get the projects covered and have the projects speak for themselves. And so if you, lo if you look at the project and you think it's, it's a beautiful project, it renders well or it's finished, it photographs well, speak with you know, various different r reporters, you know, go to the different outlets, go to different publications, that is the best word of mouth for a project. And you can get more out of a well-placed you know, individual article that's written about a project that's beautiful than you can out of any ad spend. The, 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 the New York Times, when we opened up 81st Street, the New York Times did an article. We had 600 inquiries after the article. And you can't get that yeah. based on taking an ad on the New York Times at all. Uh, so uh, I also think that, uh, as, as Joe was saying, I agree with 100%, a well-placed placed media uh, ad that goes online, that goes viral, or having a party where you have a certain person who has an, a, an amazing Instagram following, it's just an entirely, entirely different world. You know, the new term is influence seekers, right? You've got all these influence seekers. It's an entity, I did a show on branding and marketing and I had some very young guys in their <clears throat> 30s, 40s who were branding experts, and they were talking about Hyper. Hyper is a company that is owned, created in Israel, and it's partially owned by Silverstein Properties, and basically they target how you should market. Mm -hmm. There's specific words, there's specific products, mm -hmm. and the need. When you're looking at a deal, how important are you looking? Is it important that they open up a sales office? It, it depends on the product. It depends on the exact time in the market. I mean, there's, project, there's pro, uh, projects for which that's not going to be economic and probably not the best use of the overall capitalization, you know, maybe some of the smaller boutique properties. We've seen the entire gamut in our book. You know, we have the projects where the first 20% of the units fly off the plan. Um, there's more mature projects where I'd say immediate occupancy is a plus, maybe some ability and willingness at the end of the project to cut pricing a little bit because, you know, and keep in mind, that's not cutting pricing from the original Schedule A, that's cutting pricing from, you know, the 16th pricing amendment. So they're still very much ahead of plan. 
It's also been our experience with, with M&T is that the larger the loan, the, the more focused yeah. everyone is on pre-sales. Yeah, absolutely. And so the, when you have a loan where there's multiple participants, you tend to see more pre-sales. If it's held on balance sheet, you often see less. Now, there was an article related was complaining about construction costs mm -hmm. and the union situation. Ken was mentioning previously in the green room that construction costs are down. Do you well, feel that way? Well, I think what we've all seen is that building permits are down. And when we track building permits uh, from 2015 till now, they've gone down successively every year, uh, especially in you know, building condominiums. I think in December of this year, of 2017, I think if I recall this statistic, I saw there was one new plan that was submitted, which is really unheard of, I mean, if you really think about it. But the, uh, the amount of building permits has gone down, and logic dictates that construction costs are going to go down. And we have seen it. We have, we have seen it um, uh, in our project on 81st Street against the project on 30th Street. Uh, the project on 81st Street is considerably more high-end. Granted, there are complexities in terms of foundation, et cetera, but uh, you know, apples to apples, we see that there's a decrease in a lot of trades and a greater desire for a lot of the trades to, to navigate so, so and negotiate here, deals. We were also mentioning in the green room that it's harder today to find land because many landowners don't want to sell their land. You have to be more creative and sophisticated making situations where you're perhaps leasing the land or doing something else. You've done that recently on your two, other pro on your two projects, yeah, right? Yeah, Joe and I were just talking about that, the way to just go in and bid for land. There aren't that many deals you could buy that way anymore because there's still a great schism between what sellers want and what buyers want. Uh, and I don't think that's closed at all. So you've got to be creative in terms of structure. You've got to go to a property owner and say, look, I'll give you the retail and we'll reduce the purchase price and try to reduce your basis by giving up the retail on the, on the residential portion or structuring it in a tax advantageous way. So deals are not plain vanilla anymore. Uh, none of them are. And I think that's the strength that the two of us bring to the development world, which is I think banks like M&TC and other lenders and other now, equity Now what about emerging neighborhoods? Okay, you know, you're in Brooklyn Heights, okay, but Correct. downtown Brooklyn is a different neighborhood. And we were talking before with George, and who's possibly involved with one of their clients, Sextel, who's building this Brooklyn Point, which is a mm -hmm. unique condo, and it also has great tax benefits. So it, it has a lot of attributes over there. Certain people believe that there's, there are good opportunities in certain parts of northern Manhattan, Inwood, Harlem, so on, okay? Then there are a lot of people who are believing that, you know, um, flushing Queens and, you know, transit-oriented developments. How are you looking when you're lo trying to find your next location? I mean, we're, we're, we're all over the city looking, and we actively look in, actively in Brooklyn, Manhattan, and Queens is where we predom predominantly focus. And so we, we have, you know, projects uh, across the city. I remember one time when you never went to Brooklyn and Queens. Yeah, right? well, the times have changed, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, this is 2018. And so, you know, we're, we're excited about new neighborhoods. And I think that if you look at, actually, some of the things that, that Ken was saying that he's focused on, you know, whether it's in Bedford-Stuyvesant or whether it's in Crown Heights, you know, I think there's tremendous opportunity out there. And we've looked at, at acquisitions out there. We've had trouble finding something of scale we can do. But the business model he's pursuing, I think, uh, has a lot of opportunity to it. It's hard to find scale there because the, the um, FAR is three or four. It's, it's hard. We, I wanted, and speaking about difficult deals, at one particular point in Bedford-Stuyvesant, we were working with a church that had been in its location for years. And we met with the congregants and the board and... And uh, you could have built maybe fifty or 60,000 feet. I, I mean, and if, it just if, if, was if, impossible to if, put together. If we're looking right now, you have two developments in, in Manhattan on the west side, which are basically synagogue sites, okay? One mm -hmm. of them is, you know, the SJP <coughs> site where they bought the synagogue mm -hmm. and they're building over there. And the other say, site was the congregation Habolin, where they're basically putting the synagogue back into the mm -hmm. property later on. A lot of the property sites in Harlem are being done with churches also. Mm -hmm. Some of them where the church is going in or where the church needs the money over there because well, of that. I think those are great examples of structured deals that, that Ken alluded to earlier. 
a lot of religious organizations, they don't want to sell their property. They may want to contribute it to a joint venture, and then they'll come back in later. You know, we're looking actively at opportunities like that, similar to even fee landowners that maybe a family's had the property for some time. They can't get the price they would have maybe three, four years ago, so they're contributing the property. Maybe they take back the retail like you referenced. Maybe they take condo units. Maybe they get certain cash now, and then they take more cash later. We all have to be much more creative, the, the three of us sitting up here, as to how you're structuring deals in order to transact. Now, it's an area, I mean, uh, George is predominantly in New York City, but, you know, today there is a lot of transit-oriented developments which are also becoming condos, okay? Um, you know, in Westchester specifically, mm -hmm. you know, a number of the repurposes property, the IBM, the IBM site, the Otis Elevator site in, the, you know, in New Rochelle and over there. Have you looked at going to the suburbs? I mean, I know you're in Palm Beach. We don't call it. That could be a suburb. But, uh. <laughs> well, we, we are in Palm Beach. As you know, know, we're building on the ocean down there. We have started to look in Westchester. It's not an area that, that we know as well as we do the city, but we've started to look, yes. And, and we own a, uh, a building in uh, Bedford, downtown historic Bedford. Uh, it's an old movie theater which we uh, have been working with the community and now it's turned into a not-for-profit cinema. Uh, we've dealt with um, a lot of the very, very wealthy people in Bedford. They put a group together of literally about a thousand people. We gave them seed money and uh, in that property we have five retail stores, 32 apartments, and we own the last undeveloped piece of land in downtown Bedford as well. Um, it's a challenge to get things built in Westchester. You know, if we think the New York City Buildings Department or Landmarks is a challenge, wait till you go to some of the municipalities in, in the, the, Westchester. The, the, the hardest really is a place challenge. to develop uh, is in Long Island. Because what happens is in Long Island, as someone said to me, a number of people, including your client, Alan Rose, they bring the crickets to, mm. to the community board <laughs> and they say they're, they're endangered species. With like a, a minute left, one area that, since you, Ken and I are baby boomers, okay, an area which I believe is, is growing is the senior housing. Have you thought of doing senior housing, senior condo housing? Can We've you? spent more time looking at student housing than we have on the senior side. Okay, and you? Uh, we have looked at a site recently with a church where what we would do, we would do a combination of senior and veterans housing and market housing, but it's a process. Uh, it'll, my guess if it takes place at all, it'll be three years from now. Okay. So, as I said before, you are shiny. It's the question of the press may have eluded the incorrect information. And as long as it's well capitalized, well planned, with the right players, it's going to continue and the condo market is alive and booming. And I'd like to thank Ken Horn, Joe McMillan, and George DeRay, and I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michael.